I just want to do God's will. The kind of revolution that the world needs is a Christian revolution. If you want a miracle, you've got to expect it to happen. You are the recipients of God's grace and God's blessings, and you rejoice in that reality. Welcome to Life Today Live. Randy Robinson here. Great to have you. You know, when Jesus started his ministry, uh, sort of publicly, he quoted Isaiah, and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And we understand, um, you know, that when he said, giving recovery of sight to the blind. Yes, he did heal some blind people. Not everyone who's blind gets healed. Uh, But he meant that spiritually, which is the more important thing, even though it doesn't seem like it to us sometimes. (laughs) Same is true when he said release the captives. Very much a spiritual statement, blanket statement to all. Sometimes it happens literally. And that is today's story. I've got a gentleman with me who was literally a captive. uh, And I would say rightfully so, but you'll you'll hear his story. Um, and now he's he's not because this this is not coming to you from the inside of a prison. Uh, he is out. The book where he tells his amazing story and journey is called Twenty Seven Summers. Looks just like this. This is written by Ronald Olivier, who is here with us to tell his story of a captive set free, both literally and spiritually. Ronald, welcome to Life Today Live. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. So let's uh, let's fill people in on on the backstory. Uh, take us back to that uh, that fateful day. Tell us a little bit about what your life was like that landed you uh, in one of the worst, <laughs> the most notorious prisons in the country. Yes. Yes. Well, um, I can remember. I'm a native from New Orleans, Louisiana, and. New Orleans is pretty much separated into dis- not districts, but um, wards. I was staying in the seven ward. We moved from the seven ward to the eight ward downtown area. And I can remember when we moved to the eight ward, it was so peaceful. It was a nice neighborhood. And I can remember I can remember feeding the birds on the porch with some bread. And something drastic took place in about the late 80s. It was the crack ep- epidemic. It came in and completely destroyed our neighborhood. And so with drugs always follows is a lot of violence. And during this time, um, um, I can remember um, when that took place, the birds wouldn't even come out anymore. <laughs> and that, during that transition, there was another transition that was taking place in my life too. My father was leaving and going to Florida, Jacksonville. My father was everything to me. Um, and he was my hero, and he was moving to Jacksonville. Um, you know, prior to that, we spent a lot of time together. Even though I didn't stay in the home with him, I stayed with my mother. He came, got me on weekends. We spent some holidays mm. in the summer together. He was always there and present in my life. And so now he's leaving, and I, I was I was real hurt, and that hurt turned into anger, and. Man, before you know it, this na- our neighborhood is transforming, and and so the drug dealers would be beginning to be my hero, and hmm. replacing the sight of my dad, and and so consequently the streets begin to raise me, and I started getting in all type of things in the streets, um, uh, which landed me um, in prison um, with a life sentence. Um, it it happened on. Um, on Christmas Day in 91, uh, me and a, a, another group of guys got into an altercation. Um, shots rang out, I, and two guys was left in a pool of blood. And I was the man holding the, the gun that was smoking. Mm-hmm. And so I'm 16 at this time. 16, I still was in high school, and I found myself on trial um, in about 1993 to about two years before I went to trial um, for first degree murder. I'm, I'm facing the death penalty. Mm. And man, um, prior to that, I was very optimistic. I just knew I was going home and had all these stories in my mind of 
of, 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 of what happened and how I'll be released. And, and so, um, I can remember when I first went in, I went to the juvenile bureau and, you know, usually I'll go there. My mother signed me out. <laughs> my, my mom couldn't sign me out that time. And, um, so here it is. I'm on trial for first degree murder, not knowing what's going on, all these legal terms thrown around, mm -hmm. really don't know what's going on. And, but everything got real when the jury was deliberating. The jury deliberating, they put me in the holding tank. Um, it's about 12, one o'clock in the morning. Um, I can still hear the door slam in the cell where the guard brought me and turned the key and I can hear his footsteps fade away and I'm left there alone. And that's where everything got real. Um, I start to think, okay, there are 12 people right now making a decision on whether I live or die. 12 people that don't know anything really about me. And I was like, whoa, I felt the weight of it. But I also heard this. I knew it was um, God's voice using my mother's. Um, um, prior to that, years prior to that, she told me, oh, man, if you're ever in trouble that I can't get you out, you call on G. Mm. And at that moment in that cell, I got on my knees and I began to cry out to God. I was crying. Um, and my prayer was on um, basically a deal I made with God. He said, <laughs> sure. you don't make deal with God. Flea but I made a deal with him. Yeah, <laughs> I said. And, and it was very simple. I said, Lord, if you don't let them kill me, I promise you, I'll serve you the rest of my life. Mm. And man, for the first time in my life, I experienced the peace of God. I didn't know what it was. Then I just had this inward resolve that everything was going to be okay. Mm. And um, I was like, okay. Um, and so anyway, um, I, I I go back and they find me guilty of a lesser verdict. Um, the responsive verdict was a second degree murder mm -hmm. and was carried a mandatory life sentence mm -hmm. without benefits of parole or probation. In Lamer's term, um, you die in prison. Yeah. And so yeah. that's what I was sentenced to. Um, I like to say it like this, in that cell, man, I, um, I received two life sentences. While the state was giving me life that had no benefits, he was giving me life that had so many benefits <laughs> that he encouraged us not to forget them. Okay. And so, All right. I would, I would ask you about that. But just, okay, so, I mean, you know, we we hear about this in the news. I mean, here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and I saw it just very recently, you know, a, a, a gang shooting, right? You know, and mm -hmm. we, we don't know what all that, that can mean a range of things, but basically – from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, you know, you're 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 a young kid, like all young mm -hmm. males in history. You're kind of a stupid kid, right? You know, we do stupid things. We don't understand mm -hmm. the consequences of our actions. I mean, we're mm -hmm. we're all like that. Um, and but but you're on the streets. You're out of fear. You you pulled the trigger when you thought someone was coming after you, um, and and killed another kid. Uh, and you, and you were 16 at the time, is that what you said? So, I mean, yes, sir. yeah, I mean, 16. And, and you got a life sentence for, for that. Is that fairly accurate? I mean, is that sum it up? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So when you got on your knees and made your deal with God, um, and he kept up part of, part of the bargain, I guess you would say, or whatever, you, you know, mm -hmm. regardless, you, you didn't get uh, the death penalty, which, um, you know, I want to go into some of that, but what, what did something change in you? Were you, you know, would you say that that was the moment you were born again or was, Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, Cause from that moment, um, I still did some of the same things, still <laughs> talk the same way. Um, the difference was that I wasn't comfortable doing it anymore. <laughs> I was, I was being convicted <laughs> and I, and I had nobody to tell me or teach me or disciple me to let me know what was going on. Mm. And so, man, um, I was I was very uncomfortable with what I was doing now and what I was saying. And and just like a newborn baby um, that comes out of a womb, you know, it don't look like the little gerbil baby we see. You know, it <laughs> it, it it looks like what it came through. A lot of afterbirth. They got to go through a process of being clean and yeah. fed and clothed, yeah. and that's what that's where I was. Um, I looked like what I came out of, and so it wasn't 
what two about two years before it started to look like yeah. that I was born again. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I so mean, God went to yeah. You don't you don't have anybody to change that baby's diaper. He's gonna look pretty awful until he can take care of himself. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you're now you got sentenced to. Uh, Angola prison in in Louisiana, which is kind of notorious. I mean, I know it from movies, but what, yes. what was it really like? Um, at that time, it was it was always labeled the bloodiest prison in the nation. Wow. Uh, and I knew that going, and I can remember going down the, uh, the Long Snake Road, twenty mile road to Angola, uh, right off sixty one, and I'm thinking man, what I have got myself into. And I'm thinking about all the stories I heard about in gold. Yeah. Um, I know one thing, they, they pray upon the young. Mm-hmm. The young is their prey. And so um, they will rape them, um, make them their slaves, select slaves, and do whatever they want them to do. And so I made up in my mind right there on the bus that, man, I was, I was going through this gate, a man and and I was going to leave out a man when they was walking out or in the box dead, you know. And so um, that's the type of chip I had on my shoulder. Mm. And so I get there and, and you have all this, all these things going on and, and right in the midst of it. But I would, at one time I thought it was because I just was so bad and um, they didn't mess with me. But Looking back, man, God protected me. Man, <laughs> mm-hmm. he was with me. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, he was with me in the midst of the fire, and I didn't get burned. Um, he was there with me, and he actually sent me around people who was willing to help me and not hurt me. Man, I met some of the most, man, I'm talking about most gifted, most loving, most kind group of guys that was in prison, <laughs> some pastors, you know? Yeah. And they were pastoring churches, and, and they began to disciple me and work with me. And, um, man, God really began to change and clean my life up. So what was your what was your attitude when you're in? I mean, if you look at it, look at those cell walls and and think, this is the rest of my life, uh, what what hope did you have? Man, I, I was always hopeful. It was just an inward resolve for me that said, man, I will not die in prison. I'm not going to die here. You know, I didn't know I didn't know how I was going to get out. I didn't know <laughs> when I was going to get out, but I know who was going to get me out. And so I just put my trust in the who and he took care of the how and why. You know, that was his business. And I just began to just um, focus on him changing my life and helping me and using me to help change other people's lives. Wow. I mean, what a mature attitude, because I think it might be a little more focused on the getting out than the growing up yeah. you know, spiritually. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's the grace of God. And so, and so when I when I first did, that was my focus. My sanctuary was the law library. So I started to learn the law and learn how to shepherdize cases and do this and write writs and and. But God had removed me from that and, and had me going to church. Mm-hmm. And actually, um, I got a word from God not to even mess with my transcript anymore, that he was going to take care of that. Mm-hmm. That if you, that that if um, I I would um, take care of his business, he'll take care of mine. Oh, wow. And so that's what changed my focus from trying to get out and, and, and just grapple and trying to do this and see what happened wrong in my trial and things like that. Well, that's crazy. So what what'd you do? Go to seminary or something? Yes. And so um <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what I did. No, no, I knew that. <laughs> uh, and so um in nineteen ninety five, um in Gold established an extension center there, the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. God bless him. And man, I was like, Wow. And so about ninety nine I enrolled in it, got accepted, and man, um after about four years, um Five years, 2005, I graduated uh, with a bachelor's degree in Christian ministry. <laughs> and so after you um, graduate, you're, um, you're, you're able to be a, what they call the MBA minister. Your job is just to they assign you an area, and you just go and minister, you know, and make rounds, just talk to people, and just share the gospel. And so, man, it, it just was amazing of how the, the Bible college was rapidly turning over ministers and 
to every area of the the prison was covered with ministers wow. and people was making rounds and every crack of the prison heard the gospel. And so it was turned over so rapidly to where ministers was just getting piled up on each other. <laughs> um, it, and it completely changed the atmosphere. Um, we used to sit on the ledge and joke about, man, this has been a while before we even seen a good fight, you know, <laughs> less, less than on some violence. And man, um, it, the atmosphere changed to a point to where um, there was a college, Wheaton College, that used to come from Chicago mm-hmm. and spend their spring break with us. I'm talking about young females on a basketball court with us playing. They all line and walk in the dorms <laughs> and nothing happened. It, wow. You know, because God was present there and doing some things in that prison. I, okay, so I got to I gotta think that, I mean, you know, when, when – when, if I were to turn on a flashlight outside in the daytime, nobody would notice. But, you know, you turn on even the dimmest light when it's completely pitch dark, uh, everybody sees it. I mean, what you're talking about is going into one of the darkest prisons and turning on a floodlight. Uh, yeah. What did that What did that teach you or show you and others about what the gospel does in the lives of people when we talk about i read what you know jesus said setting the captives free i mean you saw god working in a such a drastic Man, way that I it mean, was, it it was amazing just to wow. get a front row seat and actually be a part of seeing this happen mm. you know guys who you knew um had aggravated fights had jug guys who were who who caught murder charges that while they was in prison, hmm. who killed other guys in prison. Hmm. I'm talking about changing their life to where they, they crying and asking for forgiveness and God just breaking them down. And they end up being ministers. <laughs> they end up going to the, the Bible college, hmm. you know. And, man, it just was amazing, man. We was in the midst of revival and didn't even know it where people was coming from the outside just want to be a part of what was going on in the inside. <laughs> yeah, y'all, y'all, weren't, y'all weren't trying to break out of angle. People were trying to break yeah. in. <laughs> right. And wow. so, man, so many people was coming in and, man, and just was, like, amazed to what was going on. Yeah. We had our own services. I'm talking about inmate pastors. You had the whole church structure, and there were inmates. And, man, had over what – um. 40, 50 churches. That's why. You know, yeah. in wow. So they had church going on every day. You could go to church. I, you know, I, I, I want people to really take that to heart because I absolutely believe in, in the justice system and in, in man's institution that, that the government should, you know, punish wrongdoers, protect innocent people 100%. But we, got, we can't lose sight of the heart of God which is to redeem everyone, even the worst, yes, sir. even the inmates, right? Even the lifers, even the ones on death row. Um, and, and it's just, but we can do both things at the same time. We, we can have justice in society where laws must be upheld. We can also have forgiveness and freedom spiritually where God's laws can prevail. And, and so I, I love that you're front row seat of that. All right, 27 summers, you spent a long time there. Um, yes, sir. Then what happened? And so, um, um, eventually, um, like I said, the ministers were stacking up. So the ward came up with this, what I believe was a God idea to send out missionaries, <laughs> um, send out inmate ministers to other prisons in um, Louisiana to assist chaplains and pastor <laughs> churches. <laughs> You know, that's crazy. That's insane. I'm <laughs> that's, telling you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and so um, here it is. Um, I made a decision to go out to another prison and, and pastor a church and, and assist a chaplain. And, man, God did some great things there. Man, we started a lot of great ministries. Um, got connected to an awesome chaplain there that, that helped, you know, mature me and leadership and push mm-hmm. me, in, you know. And man, um, later I, I I came back from Angola. I mean, from um Cottonport to Angola, because you you're required to spend at least two years there. 
on a missionary journey and then and then go back if you want or you can go to another prison (laughs) i'm sorry i'm sorry it's just it's it's it is funny but it is fabulous i mean who'd have thought you go to prison to get your seminary degree and become a missionary to other prisons um yes but that just, to yeah. me, that's just that's just the heart of God, man. He wants to reach everybody. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, okay, so, yeah. you're, so your 27 summers weren't all in Angola. You're actually going out and, and right. others. What I did you to, did you just assume that that was the rest of your life and you're good with that? No, I always like I said, I always felt I was going home. I mm-hmm. could remember at um at Cottonport at that place. I had um I had I had a prayer meeting that I had started. Um, I sent out a fly. So all the dorms saying we're gonna have prayer. You know, anybody that's bought out of code, we have a lot of time. We're not getting out who's been changed. Look, um, get get all your legal work, your paperwork, your your rap sheet. We're gonna put it on the altar. There's another judge, you know, that's gonna scrutinize your case. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's another courtroom higher than the courtroom we went to. And um, man, amazing the, the response because normally prayer meetings, you know, are short. You know, a lot of people don't come to prayer meetings. You know, very few. Man, I had it was hundreds that came. We had so much paperwork on the altar, and man, God just He just man um really saw our faith in that because God's passing up the law library and bringing the illegal work to the altar. Yeah, you know that was insane. Yeah, and the presence of God came in there and did some things, man. And man, guys just went to going home. Mm. They was being delivered, guys who never even went back to court. They were trying to figure out how they was leaving, mm. you know. And so we were, they're always on the way home. They're stopping the chapel. Pastor, I'm gone. Mm. Man, I'm gone, man. And and um, I just encouraged them to keep doing what they was doing here on the outside. Yeah. And, man, um, I knew my time would soon come. Mm. And sure enough, when I get back to Angola on um, by 2012, um, the United States Supreme Court comes down with <laughs> with a new ruling that said, in Miller versus Alabama, that said it was unconstitutional to give a juvenile a mandatory life sentence. Said it violated our Eighth Amendment, which was on um, cruel and unusual punishment, uh-huh. and that a juvenile is more than likely to be rehabilitated than adult because they're not fully developed and went went into the science of the brain. Um, some you said earlier, you know. Why we do crazy things? Right. Talking about the frontal lobe, mm-hmm. the frontal lobe of the brain, um, which which helps you appreciate risk and right. consequences, is not fully developed. Oh yeah, as as and, as any young male can attest to. <laughs> yes. Well, or, yeah. And, looking back, anyway. So, right, and so yeah. Yeah, no, no. So so now there's a Supreme Court case. What does that do to inmates like you? And so, um, what it done for me that it. It said that my um, sentence that I had at that time was illegal. Mm -hmm. It was unconstitutional. So I had to file into the to the district court um, um, a writ to um, correct illegal sentence. Hmm. So I got a lawyer. We did that. They granted the writ. And so now I'm going through a um, process to be resentenced. And um, Hmm. I get there to cope. And my lawyers are rattled because they said, oh, man, they got a victim, the victim family here, um, sister. And I'm like, really? And he's like, you know, and 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 in those terms, of course, that's very heavy. If you got victim opposition, you're more likely not going to go home. So are you so, so um, just help me understand this process because I'm not familiar with it. You're in front of a jury mm-hmm. again, or is this within the no, prison? No, it's a judge. It, it's a it's judge. A judge. Um, it's it's not challenging my conviction. It's challenging my sentence. It's my sentence. sentence is illegal. So sentencing. So they person. have to re-sentence me based gotcha. upon Miller versus Alabama to get in line gotcha. with the law. Okay, and yeah. and and so the sister of the young man that you killed right. is there at this hearing. Yeah, and so they have to notify our victims anytime they do anything yeah. with us. And so, um, say the sister was there, but I noticed when I came in, there was this lady on the front row across and just staring at me. She looked at kind of familiar, and I didn't want to keep staring at her because I know I looked at already intimidated. I got shackles on and yeah, and, yeah. and and handcuffs, and you know, yeah, and yeah. so I kind of glancing out my peripheral and just 
she still was staring. And then when he came to me, I was like, no, that's not his sister. I said, that's his mother. Mm. And I remembered her face from court. Um, man, when I when I um develop a prayer light, man, I pray for her more than anybody else in my life. Wow. Um, I can still see her face crying on the stand, and um, I always had a long and a great desire to have some type of dialogue with just let her know that I'm sorry for what I did. Yeah. And um, and I always saw those things on TVs, those reconciliations. And I cried just think about Lord, that's what I want. And so greater than me going home was me meeting the victim family and um the victim's mother and and asking her forgiveness. Mm-hmm. So I saw that as an opportunity. I said, man, see if I can have a um a dialogue with her. I would like to talk to her. So my lawyer goes to the DA, the DA goes to her, come back, says, No, she don't want to talk to me. Um, whatever she's gonna say, she she's gonna say it on the stand. And which was understandable. I I, sure. I get it. Sure. And but um they wind up setting my court date back the following month for the hearing. And that gave me a whole month to pray. <laughs> so I went to praying again. I went to praying mm. and, and just lifting her up. And man, amazingly when when I go back to court, she requested that she talk to me. Oh wow. And so, man, we have this dialogue. This is the Man, the hardest conversation I've ever had in my life. Yeah. You know, to look her in her face and um when she came over, I just broke the silence and I told her she when when she came, she was like this, yeah. just looking at me. Yeah, sure. And and I said, I said, ma'am, I said, I take full responsibility for the death of your son. She took a deep breath inside. And she released her arms and leaned toward me. Mm. And I said, I just ask that you forgive me. I said, I have absolutely no excuse. You know, I said, I was very young and I made a very, um, I said, a very rash, stupid decision, you know, that cost your son his life. I said, I just ask that you forgive me. And she said, she said, man, I don't hate you. She said, man, I forgive you, mm. and I believe you deserve a second chance. Wow. I'm talking about this was a very emotional time, um, very emotional. Both of, us are, both of us are crying through this dialogue. Yeah. There's no dry eye. Yeah. And um, we just having this conversation. It seemed like it took hours. I'm sure it probably was about 15, 20 minutes, but it seemed like hours, mm-hmm. you know, and man, she forgave me. She got on the stand and echoed what she said in private on the stand. Wow! And um, uh, man, it was it was amazing. Man. Uh, so I, I mean, from a spiritual standpoint, I mean, obviously that's a weight on her. Um, that God was able to lift off of her in that moment and give her some relief from that pain that you had caused. But it was also a weight off of you, the guilt. Uh, definitely knowing that i mean i I, I, how do you there's no other to me there's no other explanation for that kind of thing than god yes yes that's all it is um when 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 she said i forgive you i felt handcuffs and shackles come off of me Mm. although i was still handcuffed and shackled Mm. it Mm. didn't even matter to me what happened in the procedures of the court after that Mm. it was i it's, it's hard to explain the freedom mm-hmm. that I felt mm-hmm. at that moment, yeah. you know. And yeah. man, it it it's, it it was no no other explanation but yeah. but God. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. All right, so you go through that procedure. Uh, obviously, yeah. judge ruled in your favor. You're sitting here today. Yeah, yes. And so he ruled in my favor, gave me parole eligibility. Later, I go on the board. And get a unanimous decision to be released. And in 20, 2018 in November, I was released on parole. And man, um, it amazing moment in my life. I guess so. Um, welcome back. You know, uh, welcome back, a changed man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, 
a changed boy into a man. Uh, but so what, what does that look like? What does life look like for you? You still have to go check in with a parole officer? Are you able to get a job? What, what is, what is life yes. for Ronald um, Olivier? Amazingly, today? um, amazingly, um, the, um, when I, when I got out, I started, um, um, the former warden of, of Angola, Burl Kang got in touch with me at a nonprofit organization that he, wanted me to speak for and I was speaking for and did that a little while. And then later he became the um the commissioner over the Mississippi Departments of Corrections in Mississippi. And so he's over all the prisons and he now he's look to change this system, he's looking for chaplains. <laughs> he he calls me to be the director of chaplaincy at Mississippi State Penitentiary. Man, this is insane. Just if you <laughs> hung around anywhere around corrections, you 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 can understand the weight of this and um how big is this. It's definitely it's hard for a convicted felon to get a job, period. Sure. You know, it's impossible for him to get a job working for the Department of Corrections. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So so you, you so, you're telling me that you you went back to prison, although a free man in multiple ways? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, man, and it was an amazing journey. Um, and I still was crazy part. I still was on parole, uh -huh. so I had to go. I I was assigned um, a state vehicle with the with the state stamp on it, and <laughs> I pull up. I pull up at the parole officer next to his car with the same stamp on it, and <laughs> and, and he has an ID around his neck. You know, Mississippi Department of Correction. I have my ID, and I go in there and talk to him. <laughs> it was insane. <laughs> You know, only God can do that, man. Totally restoration. He 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 turned it all around. Mm. Oh man, mm. I, and it it opened a door for me to help a lot of guys who was in prison. You yeah. know, um, it opened. Just my story had their heart wide open for them. Yeah, you know, they was ready to listen. Yeah, yeah. You know, because they knew I understood where they were. Yeah, you know, I was just just coming in and just you know. And, well, you're, and you're, so, you're, uh, you're doing what Jesus did. You're setting captives free spiritually. Yeah, yeah. Are, are you still doing that? Is that still an no. ongoing? Um, no. Um, in April, I made a transition. Um, I'm in Baton Rouge. I work for the Louisiana Parole Project. We hmm. help guys make a transition from okay. prison to home, and so still working with them in that aspect. Um, I'm married. I've um, been married. Um, April will make five years. I have a four year old son. Congratulations. Um, just made four. Um, I'm talking about God. It totally mm. restored me, man. Um, it's amazing. It's amazing. I I mean, you kind of don't know what to say. I, I mean, there's, there's obviously, you know, one young man who didn't get to grow up and have a family. Uh, and so there's always that, that hole. Um, uh, and, and it's a tough situation, but what do you, what, what, what do you, I don't know, what, do, where do you even go? What do you, what, what's life about? You know, what's, what, what is God's calling on Ronald Olivier? What's his, well, what's his message well, to the um, prisoner, to the one who's on their way to prison? You know what I'm saying? One of the things is this, man, I, I learned to live and enjoy every moment, every day, um, and I didn't learn that when I got out of prison. I was doing this in prison. I yeah. got a sense of purpose. God was using me. And yeah. um, it was such a joy to get up in the morning in prison, mm. Mm. you know, um, and just let him use it and see where, who to talk to, you know, what to say, and pray with this guy, and just share that scripture, and, you know, and just, just sometimes just sit there and listen, you know. And, um, mm. man, um, I had committed my life to helping people, to ministering to people. And and that's what I do right now. Um, I'm on book tour. You know, um, I go around just sharing my story and, and doing book signings. And um, and before that, I was doing the same thing. You know, that's how I, that's how I got called winner of the book. Um, going, I was invited by Jim Similar to to um, Brooklyn Tabernacle. Oh, yeah. And share my story. And um, me and Jim are real good friends. Met yeah. him while I was in Angola. Yeah. And um, 
man, while I was sharing my story, one of the publishers was in the um, audience, came up to me afterwards, you know, another miracle, you know. Yeah. So the publishing company found me, yeah. you know, which it don't even go like that. Right. right. No, it's true. <laughs> and so, um, and so um, man, I went to seeing how sharing my story was impacting people. So I thought about, man, it'd be awesome to put it in a book and impact even more people. Mm -hmm. So there it is, 27 Summers, man. Uh, yeah, well, and there it is right there, 27 Summers by Ronald Olivier. You want to check that out. It's available wherever you get books. But here's here's what I see. I, I, I see in you God's eternal truth that if we will bring everything to him, the worst of it to him, our mistakes, our problems, uh, our, our, our lives, literally lay down our lives for the cause of Christ, he, he, he will redeem anything. And everything. Yes, 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 yes. He takes pleasure in it. And he, yes. Go ahead, man. That's, boy, that's good, too. He does. He he takes pleasure in it. Um, you you are a picture of redemption, Christ's work in you. And that's why when you get out of prison, you don't go, whoo, that worked. And now you go back to your, your, your new creature, new creation. What's the rest of your life look like? If, oh, if you man. Hope. I'm, <laughs> um, I'm looking at... um. And I'm just just speaking it, I'm looking for the book to become. Um, I'm looking to do another book after it, because uh, there's so much to the story. Um, especially when I get to Mississippi, you know, I was a part of, I was actually a part of two executions there. Oh man, that's a, that's a that's a whole book there. Mm. And um, I'm looking for also my books to become movies. Okay. And just minister to people through movies. All right. Yes. What What about you personally, as the dad, as a yeah. husband, as a father? Oh man, um, I I love um being um a husband and a and a dad. You know, um, I I intentionally <laughs> make time for them. You know, because I know that's my first church. That's who I need to minister to. Yeah. First. And and um. And I never want to get so caught up into helping everybody else and my family is falling apart. Yeah. See that so many with pastors and ministers, you know, oh, yeah. of the gospel. And that's one thing I don't want to do. Um, and so I focus on them also, man. I think, man, one day um, I'll probably be a pastor of a church, you know, more likely. Yeah, well, yeah. you are. You are, whether it's got a building or yeah. not. You got it. You got right. a lot of people you're shepherding. So, I mean, that's that's already there. One thing I didn't ask that I want to follow up on um, is is your mother. Is your mother? Um, is she still with us? She's still alive. Yes. So, yes. Yes. How, how did it impact her? Because she's the one that said, "When I can't help you, turn right. to Jesus." Oh man, um, it really impacted her, um, especially when she's starting to. When she when she began to visit me and, and witness that I was changing, that God was doing stuff in my life, you know, and how um I would call her home and encourage her, mm -hmm. you know, and encourage other families, had other families, you know, you know, encourage them to go to church and to seek God, and <laughs> you know, and and people, it was amazing. I get letters from family, you know, trying to get some direction for their life while I was in prison, <laughs> you know. And so um, she's doing well. She's in Arlington. She's been there since Katrina. You know, um, she was a victim of Katrina yeah. um, in New Orleans. And so, um, man, she's doing pretty good. She's probably the most proud mom ever. I bet. I bet. And and and, yeah. and she should be. And if you're a if you're a praying mama, and yeah. it looks like there ain't no hope, don't stop praying. I mean, you talk about the power of a praying cool. mother. Uh, yes, I love yes, it. Yes, All yes. right, but Ronald, man, what I, I just love that you're sharing your story. Keep sharing it. Keep, you you know this, but I, I encourage you as as much as I can. Just keep setting those prisoners free, man. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anything I missed? Yes, anything you want to add before I let you go? I want to make sure. That's it. I just off. um, I think I just want um, I want when people read my book um. Uh, to get hope, you know, hopeful people. I'm, I call it filling hope buckets. You know, you know. I used to be a drug dealer. I'm a hope dealer now. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, I'm. I'm. That's what I want to do. Um, and and just be a sign that points to God. You know, not myself, because it was all Him. You know, He gets the glory, and I'm telling you, without Him, I wouldn't be sitting here. You know, 
and well, man, just I mean, you, encourage people to, to give him your life, man. He 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 know what to do with a life. And you're you're living you're living proof of it. Yeah, you're living yes, proof sir. of it. All right, thank you again. So so great to have you. Here. Appreciate your time and your testimony. Yes, sir. Thank all you out there for watching. Man, hit that share button. You know somebody that will be encouraged by this. And do check out 27 Summers. You want to get all the details and all as much as he's gotten in this first book. Looks just like that. Available wherever you get books. Appreciate you guys being here. Hit like, share, subscribe. We'll see you again next time here on Life Today Live.